kinds of assumptions going on w with these studies. Uh, and what's lacking is an understanding of the difficulty of governance here, yeah, both at the macro level and at the micro level. So at the government level, nothing gets ring-fenced. Uh, South Africa's laws are very clearly orientated towards money coming into the treasury, and then there's a formula that works out distribution across the, the provinces and down uh, to communities. And there's no way in which a specific amount of money would be ring-fenced for communities. Uh, Plus, the distribution mechanisms haven't been worked out. It's very easy to put forward a number uh, and to say that we'll get X amount in and this will somehow alleviate the plights of communities. It ignores the fact that communities are dynamic and when there's money available, if it ever did become available, uh, that people would flow into those areas. And so this idea that communities would form a buffer against poaching, uh, there's just no evidence to suggest that that would actually hold in reality. The other thing about communities is that it's clear that a rhino alive in the wild produces much more value over its lifetime uh, for photographic tourism uh, than, uh, than a dead rhino. And a dead rhino is always going to win over even a farmed rhino that, whose horn is reproducing because it's cheaper to jump the fence uh, and to poach a rhino, especially if the demand is predominantly or the, the attractive demand is for wild caught product. So you could put any number before me and I would tell you it wouldn't solve our community problems. What solves community problems is inclusive broad-based development and tourism is a critical part of that picture and tourism is not going to be enhanced by, uh, by South Africa having a reputation for commodifying its rhinos and farming them uh, intensively to satisfy a market for which its proponents don't even know the size of. So when you start to try and think of ways to sell rhino horn, the speculators are assuming that they can create a collaborative effort and go and sell that, which is essentially a cartel. Mm. And cartels are illegal. You cannot have cartels around the world unless it's government to government. And we've seen how the government to government worked when South Africa went to CITES and we had the 2008 ivory sale. What happened was that the government of South Africa went to CITES and said, listen, we want to sell our ivory stocks for mortalities and the money's going to go to conservation. It's a very good one line. Mm. The reality is that that single sale spiked, the, started the whole ivory poaching tsunami. Because what happens is that the only way it's legal is for the South African government to go and take all these rhino, uh, rhino horn and create the mechanism and they've got to trade with another government and the only other government where it's possible is Laos, North Korea and maybe Vietnam. But can you imagine the North Korean government or the Laos government or the generals in Vietnam and how much corruption they're going to be dealing with there and to deal with a government system here which has also got its leakages and its corruption. How much of that money is actually going to flow through to communities and to conservation? Especially as Ross says, once it goes to central treasury and the money can't be ring-fenced.